Grace and peace to you and welcome on this sixth Sunday of Pentecost. It's good to be back with you and I thank uh, Brother John for filling in for me while I was away for two weeks. Um, we are reading from the Gospel of Mark this summer and we're going to go pretty much sequentially. So we continue to pick up uh, where we left off last week, hearing today probably famous stories about a woman who is being healed and a young girl who also Jesus uh, wakes up, basically. We begin our worship this morning with a prelude. While I was away, one of the interesting things I learned about an ancient practice of the church was that those who were seeking penitence, confession, would sometimes approach the altar licking the floor along the way. Uh, never heard of that before, but apparently it was quite common. Fortunately, the church has stopped that practice. Uh, uh, Vinny is very happy about that. He wouldn't want to clean the carpet every Sunday. But instead, we'll remain seated in a contrite position for our confession this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us gather with true hearts that confess our sins to God, that earnestly ask for forgiveness, and that trust in our renewal through the work of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you all my sins with which I have offended you and my neighbors. I am sorry for them. I devote myself to repentance and pray for your mercy. In your boundless grace and compassion, send me your Holy Spirit that I may be strengthened in my faith and made ready for a life obedient to your will and your way. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, in obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Great and faithful God, your mercy and compassion abounds for all. Give us your spirit so that we will honor you with our own merciful and compassionate love for others. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is a lesson from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, 
there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and to be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. second lesson is a reading from 2 Corinthians. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for his sake, for your sakes, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you, who began last year, not only to do something, but even to do- desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fifth chapter. And Jesus crossed over again to the other side of the lake. A sizable crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. And one of the leaders of the synagogue, whose name was Jairus, came and, seeing him, fell at Jesus' feet and exhorted him greatly, saying, My little daughter is afflicted to the point of death. Come, so that you may lay your hands on her, so that she may be saved and live. And Jesus went with Jairus, and a sizable crowd followed Jesus and pressed in on him. And there was a woman who was in hemorrhages of blood for 12 years, and she had experienced sizable suffering from a sizable number of physicians, and she had been spending all that she had and not profiting, but rather coming into terrible problems. Hearing about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd to touch his garment, for she said, If I may touch even his clothes, I will be saved. And immediately her spring of blood was dried up, and she knew in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And immediately Jesus, knowing in himself the power going out from him, turning in the crowd, said, Who touched my garment? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, afraid and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and prostrated herself before him and told him the whole truth. But Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be whole from the affliction of your disease. While he was speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter has died. Why still bother the teacher? But Jesus, overhearing, was speaking the word, saying to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he did not allow anyone to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And coming into the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and much weeping and much wailing, and entering, Jesus said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is sleeping. And they laughed at him. But casting all of them out, he takes the child's father and mother and those who are with him and enters where the child was. And grasping the child's hand, Jesus says to her, Talithia, come, which is translated, Girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And at this they were ecstatic with great ecstasy. He admonished them greatly so that, they should, that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. When was the last time you felt hopeless? When you felt that there was no possible way for things to work out the way that you wanted them to work out? Maybe you felt hopeless over something really big, like a health crisis. Or maybe it was a financial crisis. Or maybe it was a relationship crisis. But really, we deal in the currency of hope and hopelessness all the time. So maybe your hopeless feeling was actually over something much smaller. Like, maybe you felt hopeless about getting to work on time because the traffic that morning was just crazy. Maybe you felt hopeless about your team winning the soccer game because there was only a minute left on the clock and you were down three goals. Maybe you felt hopeless about incentivizing your daughter to put the phone down, even for dinner at least, please. When was the last time you felt hopeless? 
then you will have a sense of what the characters in this gospel scene are feeling. Not Jairus, that synagogue leader, and, and not the woman in the crowd. They're not the ones feeling any hopelessness, actually. Instead, you know how the doctors who have been treating this woman are feeling. You know how those mourners at Jairus' house are feeling. They are the ones who are experiencing hopelessness. For 12 years, 12 years, that woman in the crowd has been going to doctor after doctor after doctor to get cured of her bleeding. And maybe you know how that goes. How medicine is still as much an art as it is a science. How we rely on our doctors to run the proper tests, to think about our situations, draw on their experience, and come up with a diagnosis and a treatment plan that is going to make us better. And thanks be to God, it often works out that way for us. But sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. And maybe you have experienced having a doctor who just cannot figure out what is wrong and how to make you better. A doctor who runs out of options, and then so you go to another doctor in hopes that you have a different result. And maybe then there's another doctor, and another, until you've run out of doctors. For this woman, she was hopeful that some doctor would be able to cure her, but it is the doctors who have lost all hope of providing her any cure whatsoever. And once the doctors have lost hope, everyone loses hope. And then you are a hopeless case. In the same way, it is not Jairus, the synagogue leader, who's lost hope for his daughter. It's the mourners at the house they are the ones who now see this girl as a hopeless case. So, if you know what hopelessness feels like, you know what these doctors and what these mourners are feeling. Jairus and the woman in the crowd, on the other hand, are actually full of hope. Hope that Jesus can do what it is they expect Jesus to do for them. Which Jesus does. Which then raises the question for me, what is it exactly that Jesus does for them? Because I wonder what it means when Jesus turns to the woman in the crowd and he says to her, go in peace and be whole from the affliction of your disease. It makes me wonder, what is the affliction of her disease, actually? Because whatever the hemorrhaging, the bleeding has been doing to her, apparently she's been able to go to doctor after doctor for the last 12 years without any problem. And today she's still able to make her way through a pretty dense crowd to actually get to Jesus. Which means that the people in the crowd don't even know that she's got some problem because if they knew what her issue was, they would never let her even into the crowd. And then even Jesus. Once he knows the power has gone out, he looks around. He doesn't recognize who is the sick person that's near him. And even though we know that she's been healed, Jesus does not say to her, go in peace and be healed of the affliction of your disease. Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith saves you. Go in peace and be whole. Which it turns out is exactly what the woman was hoping that Jesus would do for her. She was hoping, believing, trusting that literally she would be saved. And what she's being saved from is not just the bleeding. She's being saved from being a hopeless case in everyone's eyes. Which is the same for Jairus' daughter. 
The interesting moment for me in that little scene is when the mourners laugh at Jesus' assessment that the girl is only sleeping. Come on. I wonder, actually, how earnest their mourning is if they're able to stop and laugh at Jesus at that point. But from their perspective, what Jesus is saying, what Jesus is suggesting, is laughable. It's crazy for Jesus to come with his perspective on the situation. But did you notice that it is these mourners that Jesus casts out as he does the demons? Because then apparently this hopeless case, this little girl who was seen by everyone to be dead and have no hope, is awakened. And we have two scenes about the miracle of hope. Hope that comes from a perspective that only faith can give to us. A perspective that does not see as others see, but sees through a faith that has been proclaimed to us in and by the word. The word that Jesus gives to us and the word that Jesus is. Now I want to finish up by just noting three small things that I think we should contemplate as we consider this scene. The first thing I think we should think about is how faith in this scene is trust that Jesus brings hope to those that others see as hopeless. Faith is believing that Jesus comes at situations from a different evaluative point of view than others do. And that Jesus' evaluative point of view is truth. Even when others find his perspective to be hopeless and laughable. It's truth. And then second, I think we ought to think about how it is that Jairus and the woman in the crowd make an effort to connect with Jesus in order for Jesus to be able to fulfill their hopes and expectations. It's notable that the woman and Jairus are not just staying at home, praying and hoping Jesus shows up and does his thing. Cooperative effort. Definitive expressions of faith, actual responses, are part of what the truly hopeful do. And then the third thing, and I think probably most importantly for the church today, I think we need to consider how we are to be like Jesus in this scene. How we as the church are to be a place where those who others declare as hopeless can come and be saved. While I was away, I visited a a lot of churches that have been around for hundreds of years. And in each one of them, there were clear signs of how the ancient church was clearly a place where the hopeless could come in order to find hope. They were places where the human and the divine clearly were supposed to interact around sacred objects like relics, the bones of saints, around sacred rites like communion and baptism, confession, licking the floor as you came to the altar, around sacred spaces like the altar and chapels and crypts. The church was the place where clearly hope was to be found for the hopeless. We need to consider how do we do that today? How do we as the church affirm the hope that faith brings? How do we live out and make real the perspective that others find as laughable and hopeless, but we find as truth? That we find as the hope that we are seeking. A hope that will make us whole. A hope that will keep us from settling on being a bunch of hopeless cases.
We confess our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to heaven as living in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Planes, trains, and automobiles, not to mention buses and cruise ships. Whether you're traveling around the world, across the state, or exploring your own neighborhood, may you learn new things, encounter new people, taste new foods, get out of your comfort zone, and most importantly, find a few moments to rest, relax, and reconnect with yourself. Lord, in your mercy, you are great. As we celebrate with barbecues and fireworks this 4th of July, let us not forget to give thanks for all those who have fought to win our independence and sacrifice to maintain our freedoms over these past 248 years. Lord, in your mercy, you are great. While we're all hopefully taking a step back from the hecticness of our September to June lives, let us remember that death and illness know no restful time. We pray for those who need healing, those who heal, those who are mourning, and those who are now at eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you hear the prayers that we offer for ourselves. For it is into your hands that we commend ourselves, and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of our Lord be with you all.
Let us pray. God of grace and abundance, we joyfully offer these gifts of thanks for your blessing in our lives. We pray that you find what we bring in this moment to be an acceptable and adequate reflection of our gratitude. That you will continue to look on us as your faithful people, worthy of your favor and beneficence. And with humbleness in the face of our hubris, we beg your forgiveness for our lack of attention, respect, and care for all of you provide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise, call us to your table, grant us your life. In the night in which our Lord was handed over, he took the bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the, to the disciples, saying to them, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for my remembrance. Then after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for my remembrance. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And save us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve in all need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Just a quick reminder that next week we do begin our outside worship. So if you want to come and sit on the memorial lawn, it's beautiful at uh, 945. Just a slightly different liturgy, but uh, still communion and everything else. At this time, we invite everyone to make their way to the fellowship hall, find a seat at a table, get to know some new friends, <laughs> and we will be in Trolley to begin our celebration. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.